Great. Well, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome our uh, Terre Haute Symphony Orchestra Principal Trumpet, Jay Ellsmore, um, to our tour of the orchestra presentation today. He's going to be talking about the trumpet concerto genre, and um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this as a woodwind player. I don't know much about the brass, so um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Jay so he can walk us through his presentation. Okay. When attending a symphony orchestra concert, hearing a concerto is very routine. You hear a performance of a work that shows off the musicianship of the composer, soloist, of course, and also the solo instrument. The solo instrument is usually the piano, a string instrument such as violin, viola, cello, or perhaps even double bass, uh, woodwind, it's very common, or the human voice. Although the trumpet has maintained an important role in the symphony orchestra for hundreds of years, one does not often expect to hear a trumpet concerto when attending a concert. The audience expects rather to hear the trumpet utilized as a fanfare instrument like in Rossini's William Tell Overture, uh, perhaps an extra timpani part like with the music of Mozart, or lucky for us, a prominent soloist or section instrument in a Mahler symphony or other late romantic work. There are, however, many outstanding trumpet concertos out there that are very deserving and, in my opinion, underplayed in the orchestral scene. I'd like to introduce just a few of these concertos today in the hope that you learn to appreciate the instrument's potential as a feature solo instrument. I'll be talking mainly about three trumpet concertos today, each one from a different era in music history. I will also be performing a few sections from each work in order to encourage you to listen to the complete works on your own. Now, I'm actually going to go backwards chronologically. I'd like to start with the more so-called modern era, 20th century, 21st century. And I'm going to start with a piece that's actually not for solo trumpet. Sometimes it is called the Piano Concerto No. 1 by Dmitry Shostakovich. You may be thinking, well, what's going on? This is a trumpet presentation. Why are you talking about a piano concerto? Well, another name for this work that's also very common is the concerto for piano, trumpet, and strings. Now, if you're looking to, to listen to trumpet concerto repertoire, I think this is a really, gra really great place to start. Um, if you're used to hearing piano concertos, if you go to concerts, you probably are. Um, you may feel a little bit more comfortable hearing that. Um, another reason is uh, it's, it's a fun work. Um, you get to hear trumpet play a lot of melodic lines. It's not your typical modern trumpet piece. Um, that can be a little bit harsh or atonal. A little bit of history about this piece. Uh, it was finished when Shostakovich was just 26 or 27 years old in 1933. This was before his first government censure. He, he was free to write what he wanted. And in this example, he was having a lot of fun when he wrote this. It's just a fun piece. He uses a lot of parody in this work, including a few seconds of ragtime toward the very end of the concerto. That's my favorite part. Um, if interested in listening to works for trumpet and orchestra, like I said, this is a great place to begin. Um, this piece has several catchy melodies, especially the lighthearted trumpet solo in the final movement. And another reason why this is, this is a great place to start is because, um, like I said, the prominent instrument is a piano, so you're used to hearing that kind of texture with the piano and orchestra. Um, it's more familiar to the concert goer. And finally, it's, it's written by a very well-known composer, in Dmitry Shostakovich. In the first movement, the trumpet just has a few lines here that go back and forth with the piano. I keep using the word fun with this piece because it's, it's just really fun. From what I've researched, Shostakovich had a really great time when composing this work. Here's a little bit of the first movement. I'll go ahead and play all of the trumpet lines from the first movement.
gets a bit more to play in that movement. All right, moving on to the second movement now. This movement is by far the, the most serious part of the concerto. It has a very slow 3-4 feel, giving it an almost eerie quality. The trumpet has a really big solo in this one, which I played in my, my last presentation about a, about a year ago. Uh, super lyrical, it's muted. Uh, I'm not going to play it right now because of time, but um, if there's time at the end and you'd like to hear it, I'm happy to do so. Moving on to the third movement, I would argue that this concerto only has three movements because the third movement is more like a bridge into the fourth. There's no break in the sound. Um, there's no trumpet. It's a very short movement. And like I said, it carries us right into the fourth movement. Now, in the fourth movement, this is where the all of the action is for the trumpet player. I would argue that the trumpet is equal to the piano in prominence or even more so toward the end, um, especially in the way the trumpet leads the conclusion of the concerto with this big fanfare that we'll get to in a, in a couple minutes here. This is also the most fun movement, even more fun than the first movement, um, because for one, Shostakovich references the music of Haydn, Gustav Mahler, a Jewish folk song, and Beethoven's piano solo, Rage Over a Lost Penny. So when I play the fourth movement, see if anything sounds familiar. Now this takes us to the, I think, feature solo for the trumpet in this whole concerto. Just a lot of fun to play. solo again for you because there's a really great part in this piece. About halfway through, the piano actually interrupts the trumpet by literally slamming on the keyboard. And some versions have seen, that, seen them actually play a chord, I think. Can't remember what the score says, but in one particular video, the pianist actually puts her arm on the keyboard and just slams on the keyboard, almost saying, 
this is a piano concerto. What are you doing taking the center stage? So see if you can guess where that moment is when the, where the pianist slams on the keyboard. This takes us to the very end of the final movement. The music gets a lot more hectic as the trumpet leads everything with this simple yet powerful fanfare. In between two of the fanfares, the piano suddenly goes into the ragtime theme that I mentioned earlier for a matter of seconds before spontaneously going back into the more typical Shostakovich-like material that makes a little bit more sense in the concerto. Okay, here's the very ending of the Shostakovich Concerto for Piano, Trumpet, and Strings. So we've started with a piece that's not for solo trumpet, but it's a concerto that features trumpet quite a bit. Now we're going to move to also 20th century and 21st century pieces, but for trumpet alone, accompanied by the symphony orchestra. Now this is where we probably get the most pieces to choose from. I'm going to do a screen share here so you can see this list. All right, so if you can see that, there at the top, you can see the piece I just played. Now, this is not all of them, but it's, it's most of the, I'd say, most important pieces. All right, so going backwards again, we've got the 2011 Chiofari Concerto Iberico, Petrich Zotten Concerto. We've got a Walter Ross Concerto. And there's a couple I should have included here. You may have heard of John Williams, Star Wars. He composed a trumpet concerto in the mid 90s, as did Anthony Plog. 1987, Carol Husa composed a concerto for the great Bud Herseth, who was principal trumpet in the Chicago Symphony for over 50 years. Although Husa's music, in my experience, tends to scare away audiences. Weinberg. Now, if you look here at 1950, if you haven't heard the Alexander Artunian Concerto, if you want to listen to trumpet music from the 20th century, this is a must listen to. This is a spectacular piece of music. I'd say if there are three pieces you should listen to from the 20th century, as far as trumpet concertos are concerned, I would say Alexander Artunian. Um, the others being the Tomasi, which I'll talk about in a minute, and perhaps the Gadecki. I would like to say a little bit about the Artunian. Um, like I said, I strongly rec recommend you listen to it. It's a great showpiece filled with virtuosic playing. It's got great orchestral interludes. It's got very loud moments, extremely soft ones, and some of the most beautiful lyricism in all of the classical music repertoire. I truly believe that. So if you haven't heard that, check it out. Um, the muted section in particular is, I think, the best example of this, especially if you're listening to the great Timofei Dachschützer 
playing this. He's got a recording out there. It's very, very easy to find. Doc Schutzer is his name. In fact, many of the concertos on this list from the 20th century he has recorded. So very important name in the, the trumpet world. Um, actually, short story here. When I was in a lesson, when I was in grad school, my teacher, Rob Murray, asked if I'd heard this recording when I was working on the music for an audition. And I said no, and I was kind of surprised he didn't kick me out of his office for not hearing this recording before, especially since I'd been working on it for some time. So that's the Artunian. We have the Descent Close, great piece. Um, one of the prominent performers of our time, one of the best trumpet players is Selena Ott. She's got an album out, you can see that there. She performs the descent close on this album. And she also performs the Jolive, maybe not on that same album, but you can check out that performance, at least one of them on YouTube with her playing it. 1948 also brings us the Henry Tomasi Concerto. Now, this is, this is a great piece of music. It is very, very advanced for the trumpet player to play. Um, it's not your typical... 20th century trumpet piece. Many of the 20th century trumpet pieces, as well as with other instruments, are atonal. They tend to be a little bit harsh, a little bit too trumpety, if that's, if that's a word. They, they like to show off in a way that sometimes isn't appealing to all audience members. But the Tomasi does a beautiful job of still sounding 20th century, but it just has beautiful melodies that are singable a lot of the time. And the instrument just it soars above the orchestra beautifully. So Henry Tomasi. Now, if, if you're a trumpet player, or you've heard a lot of trumpet repertoire, you may recognize this name here, oops, sorry, Gadecki. The Gadecki Concerto written in 1930. This is not the piece that most people associate with Gadecki. There's a piece that a lot of high schoolers play for their state soul and ensemble. Um, it's for trumpet and piano. It goes yum ba da bum 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 ba da 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 dum This is something different. This is the concerto that I didn't really know about until pretty recently when I listened to it, I said, wow, this is a great piece of music that deserves more attention. All right, so I'd like to move now back in time to the Romantic era. Now, this, this is when the valved trumpet and cornet were invented, and this is when they allowed us to play chromatically, but not just chromatically, play really, really well uh, and balanced throughout the register. Um, however, during this period of just beautiful music in the 1800s, early 1900s, there's a sad lack of trumpet concertos. Um, why that is, maybe it's perhaps the, the instrument was so new, or perhaps because a lot of the pieces are performed with concert band, that kind of setting or military band. But yeah, I, I just, I truly wish there were a lot more from this era because there's so much opportunity there. Uh, there is a piece by Bedrick Weber, Variations in F for Trumpet and Orchestra. I honestly can't find a recording of this. I can't find the music. I don't know. I mean, it's gotta exist somewhere, but it's just not, not a piece you hear very often. However, Oscar Burma wrote a concerto for trumpet in 1899. This piece is just, amazing. A little bit about the composer. Oscar Burma was a German trumpeter who, after studying in Leipzig and performing regularly as an orchestral trumpet player in his home country, moved to St. Petersburg in Russia, where he performed as the principal trumpet in a prominent symphony orchestra and also served as a touring soloist. However, he was sadly the victim of Stalin's Great Purge and was banished to a small town and eventually killed. However, he is a very important figure in the trumpet world because, for one, he composed the only full-fledged romantic trumpet concerto of the 19th century. Okay. This piece I'd like to play a little bit for you today. It was originally written in E minor for, for A trumpet, a little bit longer instrument, but it was later adapted for the key of F minor for B flat trumpet. Switch horns here to the B flat instrument. I was playing on a C trumpet before. Okay. Here's a little bit of the first movement of Concerto in F minor by Oscar Bruma. Thank <laughs> you. 
obviously very romantic. Very different from the Shostakovich. All right, here's a little bit of the second movement. This movement's entitled Adagio Religioso. Second to rest my lips. And that brings us to the third and final movement of the concerto. It's a rondo, allegro scherzando. Listen to the rest on your own. Okay. Now, like I was saying before, it's a shame that we don't have more trumpet repertoire, at least from the concerto scene, from this era, not just this era, from the classical era as well. Um, romantic era music and earlier tends to be loved the most by concert goers, as you, as you probably um, feel yourself. This is perhaps why trumpeter Sergei Nakaryakov, one of the few full-time trumpet soloists in the world today, mostly performs non-trumpet works, such as violin and cello concertos on trumpet or flugelhorn. I've heard several string players scoff at the idea that a trumpet player heaven forbid, would perform string concertos. But if they were to actually hear this guy play, I, they would probably think differently because he just, it's not only very virtuosic playing, makes it sound easy, but it's simply, it's so musical, he makes it sound great. It, when he plays the Tchaikovsky Rococo variations on flugelhorn, originally a cello piece, right? It's just great Tchaikovsky. So if you want to hear traditional concerto music played on trumpet, Sergei Nakaryakov is a performer I would definitely check out. Now that takes us to the classical era or the, the late classical era. I know the classical era was so short anyway, but um, this is when the keyed trumpet was invented. If you remember from my presentation a year ago, I showed a picture of the 
keyed trumpet. It functioned more like a woodwind instrument. It had woodwind like keys instead of uh, piston or rotary valves like we see on the modern trumpets today. Um, my original title for this presentation is Beyond Haydn and Hummel. Um, this instrument that I was just referring to is what brought us the Haydn trumpet concerto. If you've heard a trumpet concerto at a symphony orchestra concert, you are probably hearing the Haydn or perhaps the Hummel concerto. And there's, you know, that's understandable because they're really great works, um, especially the Hummel in my opinion, it's just a really great work. But since they're by far the most performed concertos, um, I'm not gonna say much more about them today, except um, if you haven't heard them, go ahead and check them out. Um, you, you may have a hard time finding a recording of somebody playing it on a period instrument, meaning the key trumpet. Um, but there's loads of recordings out there of trumpeters playing it on either B flat or especially E flat trumpet. Um, Allison Balsam has several recordings out there, I believe, of the Haydn concerto performed on E flat trumpet. That takes us to the Baroque era. Now, if you watch my previous presentation, um, you may remember that the instrument before uh, the late classical era did not have vowels. Um, players prior to this time had to change notes by increasing or decreasing the speed of air through the instrument. Now, this is, this is a very difficult thing to do, especially to do it well. However, the late Baroque era was a time when there were many trumpet players who excelled in this art. Um, it's called clarino playing. The clarino trumpet is when you play a Baroque trumpet in the upper register, which allows us to play a lot more notes. If you're familiar with the overtone series, the higher you go, the more notes we have to play. Um, when thinking of this music, it, I'm reminded of a movie. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Farinelli. It's about the famous Castrati who was singing during this time period. And there's a scene where Farinelli is doing a sing-off or play-off, whatever you want to call it. He sings a line, the trumpet player plays it back or vice versa. And it's, I think, a great example of how prominent and how important the trumpet was during this time period. Performers from this time were players such as Gottfried Reicha, Kasper Gleidich, and Cornelius Gensmer. All three of these players performed the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. His music, if you've heard trumpet music composed by Bach, is very advanced. It's probably the toughest music to play from this period. Um, it tends to be higher than music of the other composers, and it's, it's just very noty. Um, if you're thinking of trumpet playing and Bach, you're probably thinking of the Brandenburg Concerto No. 2. It's a very important piece in the history of the trumpet. Um, however, there's other Baroque music, in fact, a lot of it besides Bach. We have Torelli. I'll show you the album again of Alison Balsam. This album is called The Sound of Alison Balsam. She does play one of the Torelli concertos on this album. And as a bonus, she does this and everything else in the album on Baroque trumpet, or at least a modern version of it. And it just, it just sounds outstanding. Once you start hearing Baroque trumpet, you're going to understand why there was so much music written for it during this time period. It just blends beautifully with the string instruments, especially the period string instruments. Um, it's just, just great. It's a shame more people don't play it nowadays. Uh, besides Trelli, we have Vivaldi. You may have heard probably the best known trumpet work. It's the concerto for two trumpets. Bum, 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 ba da ba ba bum, bum. By far most commonly played on modern piccolo trumpets, which you'll hear in a few minutes here. We have Telemann, not just solo trumpet, but ensemble trumpet. Reuter II, Riepel, Richter, Kuferth, Michael Haydn, not Johann, not the other Haydn, Hertel, and Biscali. If you haven't heard the composer name Biscali before, I'm not surprised. He's only known to have written one work, and it features the trumpet. So. Apparently he really knew what he was doing with his one piece. Um, this piece is called Concerto for Trumpet, Oboe, Bassoon, and Continuo. It was co uh, composed in 1740, so toward the very end of the Baroque period. 
We'll start with some of the first movement. Now you're going to hear some parts that are clearly trumpet solo and some parts that are not complete background, but they're supporting either the bassoon or especially the oboe. Okay. First movement. Largo Maestoso. Hopefully this isn't too loud. Let's try this. the second movement. Largo. third movement, Allegro con Spirito. recordings of that available for you to check out on your own. I would like to say one more thing about Baroque era trumpet concerto music. Um, I mentioned earlier, like the music of Telemann and Vivaldi, they're actually concertos written for not one, but two or perhaps three trumpets. And there's an important reason for that. Now, for reasons I'm not going to get into because they're a little bit too technical. Um, the overtone series in the Baroque trumpet instrument allows for better intonation. Um, 
pianos, for example, are always out of tune because to truly be in tune, some notes, depending on what chord you're playing, you need to adjust notes a little bit sharper, a little bit flatter. The Baroque trumpet is all set. It, it does that automatically. Well, the players can still play the instruments out of, out of tune, but it makes it a lot more easy to play justly in tune. So if you hear ensemble trumpet music from this period played on period instruments, the intonation is just astounding. It's, it's just a thing of beauty. You get these what are called resultant tones. You get this ringing in your ears. That means that those chords are just locked into place. So if you get the opportunity to hear those pieces by Vivaldi or uh, Telemann with period instruments or Franceschini, that's a name you don't hear much, but he wrote an outstanding concerto for two trumpets or perhaps a sonata, I don't remember to be honest, but a uh, beautiful blend from those Baroque instruments. Okay, now, it is understandable, like I said before, why concert go goers hear primarily concertos performed by string and piano players and woodwind players. Um, those instruments, after all, have so many works to choose from, great works. You could probably spend a week listening to nothing but piano concertos and still not have enough time to hear all of the great ones. I would argue that there is enough great trumpet concerto literature to allow for more regular performances featuring the trumpet. And not just the trumpet, other brass instruments like horn, trombone, and even tuba. They do have some good music as well. Um, Perhaps another reason that trumpet players do not get the opportunity to perform concertos very often with orchestras is perhaps because people have heard many trumpet sonatas and other works for trumpet and piano and simply don't find them very interesting. I've heard faculty at, at more than one music school say just this. They just, they just don't care for the music much. Um, and trumpet players as well, um, those same sonatas I was referring to, like the Hindemith Sonata. Um, they're very popular among the trumpet players. I mentioned Hindemith. There's also the Kennan Sonata, the Halsey Stevens, the Shanes, Davies, Eric E. Wazen, and loads of cornet pieces as well, uh, like Jean-Baptiste Arbon music. So perhaps a reason that we don't get a lot of performance opportunity in front of an orchestra is because us trumpet players aren't very familiar with some of these concertos that I've talked about today. Um, when I was in school, I know I wasn't, I mean, I, I stuck to the sonatas. Um, I played Haydn concerto, I studied Hummel, but uh, I don't think I studied any other music, uh, any other tunes from the uh, concerto repertoire, which is really a shame. I've also heard that because much of the tonal trumpet concertos like the Haydn and Hummel and the Baroque period pieces um, are not played because orchestras tend to stick to classical and romantic era repertoire. But I mean, I've heard this argument, but clearly this argument doesn't hold up because you hear Handel Messiah every year. You can find many performances of it. Uh, you hear Bach constantly and other Baroque composers music performed frequently. And they tend to play it on modern, modern instruments, but it really does work. For the trumpet example, you, you heard piccolo trumpet and it plays the music from the Baroque era really, really well. So the music can and does sound simply amazing, even on modern instruments. I hope I've inspired you to start listening to trumpet concertos as well as look for public performances featuring the works that I've talked about today. If you have the opportunity to give written feedback after a concert, I encourage you to request that more trumpet as well as other brass instruments get the opportunity to perform in front of the orchestra more often. Thank you and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Jay. Questions. Jean Crossett, I know that you have been spending a great deal of time on YouTube looking at trumpet stuff. Do you have any questions for me? I think he's muted. Oh, Jean, you're muted. Unmute for me. I clicked it. There you go. You're there, good. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for letting me finish my lunch. I'm in a different time zone. <clears throat> it's lunchtime here. 
Uh, I live in Davenport, Iowa. I'm the spouse of a person who's familiar with Ollie. Uh, 10 years and earlier back. <clears throat> but uh, I have recently become acquainted with the music performed by Alison Balsam, especially the pieces that she does with Houston Davies and Trevor Pinnock. Uh, I think the album is Sound the Trumpet. I'm wondering what your opinion of her music uh, playing is. And a second question would be, do you play a Baroque trumpet? Okay. Nice to meet someone else from Iowa. I grew up in Iowa City. So <clears throat> oh, there. I'm in Davenport. <laughs> My hometown was Washington. <laughs> oh, very good. I used to play them a lot in football. Uh, all right, so Allison Balsam, she's one of my absolute favorite trumpet players to listen to because for one, she's in her prime, she's performing. Uh, today, we get the, the greatness of the modern recording technology. Um, many, many times I've turned on the radio, whether in the car or wherever, and I hear a trumpet playing and it just sounds outstanding. It's in the middle of the piece, so I don't have a chance to hear who it is. I'm like, oh, this must be Maurice Andre or one of my favorites from my youth. And then at the end they say, oh, Allison Balsam is playing. Well, clearly one of the best in the world. So I think she does it all super well. She plays in the jazz genre a little bit. She, um, the Baroque trumpet album, like I mentioned earlier in her modern trumpet playing is just really spot on. And I think one of the reasons I like her playing so much is because uh, one of her greatest role models is Maurice Andre. When I first got my set of 12 CDs from the BMG Music Club that my teacher picked out, Maurice Andre was one of those albums. So yeah, I, Proof of Allison Balsam's music, her trumpet playing, and then some. And then Baroque trumpet, um, on my last presentation, I showed that I, I actually have one that was constructed from a modern student instrument. It's a terrible instrument, but I use it for demonstration purposes. So no, I don't really play Baroque trumpet. I understand how it works, of course, and I can play some tunes on it, but um, maybe if I, if I had a professional quality instrument, I would pursue that further. Uh, they are quite expensive and it's just not something I've been asked to play before. So piccolo trumpet's been sufficient. So unfortunately, I, I do not play Baroque trumpet. Thank you. Hey, other questions? Questions from here in the room? Wait, you're going to have to give me a second. I got to run to the back because the bad people sit in the back of the classroom. <laughs> yes, you talked about the piccolo trumpet. What is a piccolo trumpet? Piccolo trumpet is roughly half the length, or if you're playing on the little bit shorter side, it's exactly half the length as your typical B-flat trumpet. So you can see, I'll hold it next to a, a modern instrument. The bell is a lot smaller, and you can see how much shorter it is. Yeah. It makes playing in the upper register not easier to get the notes out. You still need to do the same thing with your embouchure, but it's a lot easier to get the notes to lock into place. He wants to know. If, oh, sorry. He wants to know if you'll play just a, a note on each of those so we can hear oh, sure. the difference. Hopefully, you'll hear the difference over Zoom. But the timbre is a, is quite a bit brighter. I'll try to play the exact same note, but on each instrument. Units. I don't know if you can hear any difference over the computer, but it was, it has was a the little bit. Second one brighter. Yeah, yeah, I, I heard it was brighter. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, now, Christian, you were pushing the slide in and out on the piccolo trumpet. Are you changing the tuning? The, the key yes. that in. This um, piccolo trumpet. All you have to do to switch it from a B flat piccolo to a A piccolo is adjust this slide here and perhaps a little bit with these slides. Hmm. So you, Very similar to how clarinets are set up. We have a B flat and then we have an A instrument. I wish it was as easy as pulling in and out. I yeah. have to pull the instrument. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the Baroque repertoire, like the piece I played are in the key of D and on A piccolo that puts us in F. So our scale looks like this. It's mostly this, oh. <laughs> which is a lot easier than on the B flat side, it would look like this. It's got this third right. valve business. Right. And the fourth valve, in case you're wondering, it allows us to get a low note that we otherwise wouldn't be able to play. And it's it's a co very common note in Baroque music. 
So you do have to do quite a bit of transposition with Baroque music in particular? Yes. Okay. Well, I'd say 90% of the time when I'm playing Baroque music, it's in that same key of D. So I'm playing in that same scale. So maybe not so much as often. I mean, it's just as often, but it's always the same transposition. Mm -hmm. With other instruments, I have to do a lot more different transpositions. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Anybody else have any other questions? Bruce and Connie, do you have any questions? No, thanks. But what a wonderful concert. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. Well, if no one has any other questions, thank you so much, Jay, for, for doing the presentation today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Gene, for joining us for your lunch today, seeing as how he's in a different time zone. Greatly appreciate it. It's nice to see you. I need to give your wife a call. Um, and yes, please do. <clears throat> Sammy, um, we have actually, so you're all going to see me put her on the spot. One, we have a presentation coming up in August, which is great because it's ancient music, which is my, my area anyway for history. But we have the fall program guide getting ready to come out. I need descriptions. <laughs> yes. So if you can send those to me this week, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. I've got some of them are specific descriptions and others will be generic descriptions. We have a lot of our musicians are interested in, in presenting, but they're still getting their fall schedules into place. So we're trying yep. to make sure we we don't overbook anybody. So, yep. um, but as Michelle said, August 13th at 1 p.m., it's a Friday, we will have our uh, English horn. Dr. Jennifer Kirby is going to come and present on ancient music. So, ancient Greece, Egypt, uh, Mesopotamia, all of those instruments that essentially um, were, the, were the base for all of our modern instruments today. So I'm really looking forward to that presentation. And um, as we get into the fall, we'll go back to two a month, hopefully. And we'll also be presenting um, a few at Westminster in person as well. Um, so we hope to incorporate some more performances and uh, music, live music into those presentations specifically. I think that's great. So yeah, we've got we've got Wednesday presentations leading up to specific symphony concerts. Um, so if you haven't already purchased your season tickets for the symphony, because um, you can't go to all of them, you can actually purchase your tickets through Ali as well. So we want to make sure that you're going to all the concerts um, and that you're seeing the presentations in advance that just makes the the whole performance even better. So yes. thank you so much for partnering with us. Thank you, Jay, for being with us. Um, Gene, I will be talking to Michelle. you soon. Yes, Gene. I have another question for Jay, if I may, sure. please. Go ahead. Uh, Jay, is Bud Herseth still alive? No, he passed away. It must have been maybe five, ten years ago. Okay, okay. Uh, other than Sylvia McNair as a friend, uh, he's the only other musical uh, uh, musician that I know. Oh. Uh, I had the uh, privilege of escorting him way back, oh, would have been in the late 1970s. Uh, he performed with the Cedar Rapids Symphony Orchestra. Hmm, I did not My know. wife, Linda, worked for the, the orchestra at the time. And uh, he needed transportation to get to a reception. And I happened to be handy. And I, just by chance, I got to meet him. Found him a very congenial person. Yeah, he was. <laughs> I think 51 years he was principal trumpet of the Chicago Symphony. So yeah, yeah incredible. Yeah. yeah. And he did a wonderful performance that yeah. night. I think uh, Arnold Jacobs, music. Arnold Jacobs, the tuba player for many of the years that they were both in the orchestra, he said that Bud Herseth missed one note, I think every three years, maybe it was five years, and that included <laughs> rehearsals. So you don't hear yeah. that. Yeah. 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 It was it was wonderful. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here with us for our presentation today. We did record it, so we'll be sending that out just as soon as I can figure out how to process it through the system. Um, and then again, please get registered for the one coming up in, in August because I think it will be absolutely amazing. Um, how, did everybody enjoy being here to, to listen to it? It's great yes. to be here, and that way we can kind of enjoy it together. So, Gene, yeah. you don't have to drive all the way from Iowa. Please Zoom. But uh, anybody else that wants to come in person, please do so. So thank you all, and we'll see you in August. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.